Let's talk about Algebra 2, pace 1129. This is the ninth pace in this course. There's only three left after this. And uh, in this particular year that I'm making these videos, I uh, intended to get going a little faster on this one. So I'm sorry if some of you have been hanging on waiting for this pace. Um, but I actually had two trips that I made, one to Wisconsin to see grandkids and then a trip after that to Hawaii where I was a guest speaker. And then soon after I got back, I got sick. And so for like a whole week, I could hardly uh, function. Uh, so I am feeling better now. And uh, we'll try to get the videos made for this pace as quickly as possible and then finish out this course. I think we're going to finish this goal. All right. Woohoo. Now I'm going to give you a heads up. All right. For you students working through this pace 1129 and make sure your teacher or your parent uh, knows this as well. There are a lot of formulas in this pace and sometimes they say you need to memorize this formula, memorize this whole page and uh, I don't think that is a reasonable expectation. All right. So I would recommend that you have a notebook or note cards and that you write down the formulas that you are going to need uh, as you work through the pace and then refer to those while you're doing the checkups the self-test, even the pace test. You're just looking at the formulas, okay? So right away, first pages two and three here, we have a formula that we're gonna use and there is a, a gray box here. Pythagorean's theorem, hopefully that one is familiar enough that maybe you do have that one memorized already. But um, then there's a formula further down the page that looks like this, D equals, you say, well, where does that come from? Let's talk about it, all right? It's not as hard as it looks. Let's say I want to find the distance between these two points. In other words, the shortest line connecting these two points. If I were to draw a line and connect them, boom. But how long is that? Well, let's see. If I were to drop a perpendicular straight down, and then come straight over like this so that I have a right triangle. Now I can use Pythagorean's theorem, which says that c squared equals a squared plus b squared. So this would be like the c, the hypotenuse. So the hypotenuse squared is equal to this side plus this side. Let's see if we can figure out what these lengths are. Um, I'm saying that this one is two, four. So this length from here to here is 2, and then from here to here is negative 3, so 3 plus 2 would be 5, so this length is 5, and then this is 2 plus 4 is 6. Okay, so that length is 6. So to solve this, I would plug in and get 5 times 5 is 25, plus 6 times 6 is 36. Add those two numbers together and we get 61. So c squared is 61, which means that this hypotenuse would be the square root of 61. Okay? So sometimes when you do the math, it ends up being just a square root. And we can't really simplify it. You could use your calculator. In fact, I have it in my pocket here. Let me just... Um, Plug in 61, hit the square root key, so it'd be 7.81. So that would be a decimal approximation. That's not the exact value. The exact value is the square root of 61. Now I want to show you something really cool here because this is the formula that could help us. So they're all we, if all we knew were these two points, we could plug in those points and figure out the square root of 61 without having to graph it and use Pythagorean's theorem. So let's see where this comes from. Let's call this point up here x1, y1. We'll call this point down here x2, y2. It just means the x and y coordinates for the second point, the x and y coordinates from the first point. We're not using the one or the two to square it or do any math. We're just identifying it, all right? So I'm gonna use this formula now that says if I take the x2 value, which is negative three, subtract the x1 value and square that, 
and then add the y2 value, which is negative 2, minus the y1 value, which is 4, and square that. So negative 3 minus 2 is negative 5. Negative 5 squared is 25. Negative 2 minus 4, negative 6. And then negative 6 squared would still be 36. Ah, does that look similar? Look at that, 25 plus 36. And so the distance equals the square root of, see all of these, it's the square root of, the square root of 61. Okay? They say, Mr. Anger, what if I wanted to make this one x2, y2, and this one to be x1, y1? Would that make a difference? Well, let's take a look at it here. If I started with this as being x2, I would say 2 minus negative 3, 2 minus negative 3, and then over here, I would start with y2, which is 4, minus negative 2. Look what happens. 2 minus negative 3 would be 5, and so 5 squared is still 25. 4 minus negative 2 would still give me 6. 6 squared is still 36. So this is a really cool formula, all right? So it doesn't really matter which order we put these two points in. And in fact, you might even see in some books that they do the y first and then the x, or maybe they even write it as x1 minus x2. It doesn't really matter because once you do the math and you square it, you're going to get the same answer. All right. <clears throat> all that to say, on the homework, on this page three, they have um, a bunch of points. And all you're going to do is plug into this formula. But I wanted you to understand where that's coming from and why that works, and for you to not be concerned about the order, okay? So as long as you're dealing with the x and the x, and the y and the y, you should be able to easily get the decimal. And let's see, it says leave radical answers in simplest form, then give the approximate answers to two decimal places. So they want you to give two answers. First, the square root answer, simplified. And then secondly, use your calculator and carry it out to two decimal places. All right, have fun with that. And we'll come back and talk about circles next.